coming here, and thank you, Alex, for your kind introduction and digging out the fun facts together with me, which is maybe not that funny. Um, so before I start my presentation today, I want to first show gratitude to the Richard Carson Center for uh, granting me this wonderful research uh, fellowship that I have been based in the Land House for the past three months. And I also want to say special thank you to all my Land House followers who I spend really amazing research times and casual gatherings. And also this also extends to the broader RCC researcher communities. From many of you, I've really learned a lot for the past three months. I also want to um, acknowledge my home institution in Hong Kong, City University of Hong Kong, uh, where I did the PhD research and uh, defended successfully uh, early this year, actually. Okay, so um, today I would like to talk about an ongoing research that I have been doing for the past three months uh, here at RCC. It's titled Configuring the Chinese Anthropocene Visuality and Counter-Visuality, the Case of the Peruva Delta. So um, to start, I want to introduce some key frameworks in my research. First is visuality. It is one of the central subjects in the visual culture where I mainly based my discipline. So according to Hal Foster and Nicholas Mirzov, visuality is different from vision and visibility, which emphasize more on optical capability. It's more about the visualization process with visualization technologies and the rather stable form of aesthetics in the seen or the unseen. We are all familiar with the concept of the Anthropocene, this new epoch proposed by scientists to better recognize the profound ecological impact of the human activities of the planet, which is coming more to humanity scholarships and also to public discussions. So Mirlof states that no more can humans see the Anthropocene as it's extending across centuries through dimensions across time. It can only be visualized. However, the visualization of the Anthropocene is charged with what he termed as Anthropocene visuality. And this visuality problematizes from years of sight. It keeps us believing that somehow the war against nature that Western society has been waging for centuries is not only right, it is beautiful and it can be won. A classic example, as we may see here, is the atomic bomb photography heavily uh, undertaken by American nuclear photographers in the last century to portray the nuclear event as a visual sublime phenomenon to conceal the lethal and catastrophic effect for humans and the non-humans. While Mizov mainly rooted his discussions of Anthropocene visuality in Western visual culture to debunk the imperial and colonial heritage in the representation of nature, he did point out the hierarchical orderings and differentiated aesthetics and how some Western cultures treat supposedly non-Western subjects. An example he traced is how cultural productions aestheticize the industrial smog as metropolitan byproducts and subject of romanticism in London and American Bay cities. As we can see in this classic paintings of Monet um, of Sunrise, which actually capture the industrial pollution of French port, or another film, recent white experimental for the green fog portraying the San Francisco smog as psychedelic and romantic, both actually depict the industrial small as byproducts of metropolitans and not so harmless for human health. But in the case of a um, uh, depiction of the Beijing Olympics, the Beijing Olympics, uh, the Beijing smog is depicted as severe pollution events, a failure of the state management, management of the environment, as if it's isolated from the uneven global industrial chains. I quote from Musov that the imperial smoke is a positive sign of the energy and vitality of the modern metropole, where the smog of developing world capitals are miasmas, threatening to health and vitality. We witness this long lasting of the Western century Anthropocene gaze in the stigmatization of the COVID 19 pandemic as the Chinese virus, treated as an accidental, isolated regional case or just a flu. While, as we may know as researchers from human, environmental humanities, that the ongoing pandemic is exactly rooted in the fundamental global ecological crisis, including its extravagant urbanization and climate change. It is indeed a disease of the Anthropocene. Therefore, Anthropocene visualities are charged with hierarchical biopolitics and geopolitics. How can we configure a counter-visuality of the Anthropocene? 
Apart from what Mizu pointed out as shedding light on global protests for environmental justice and democratic indigenous environment rights, we can also engage with what other scholars term as to uh, as reversed or redirected Anthropocene visuality to adopt a non-human or not quite human gaze or virality. I argue that we should also engage with localized and place-based manifestations to resist an over uh, universalizing tendency. We can also diversify the aesthetics of human and more than human in entanglements in the multiple Anthropocene worldings. So now comes to an ongoing research place in the Pearl River Delta in the south of China, where I spent most of my teenagehood and partial adulthood there. The Pearl River Delta is one of the most active human habitats in the reciprocal geological sediment of river system and anthropogenic engineering. If viewed as one megacity, according to the World Bank in 2015, the Pearl River Delta exceeds Tokyo to be, to be the biggest urban area in the world regarding its population and geographical size. Meanwhile, the, Anthropocene, uh, the anthropogenic activities have greatly exploited the Delta's environmental natural resources, disturbed the local ecology, resulting in growing environmental crises, including pollution of water, soil, air, erosion, loss of biodiversity. We can see in this um, satellite image the drastic change from 1979 to 2000 of its uh, profound human altered landscape. Urban architect and landscape researcher Dorothy Town pointed out that it's the first time in 5,000 years that currently the sediment rates of the Pearl River Delta are lower than erosion rates. <coughs> the extensive river network nourishes rich agriculture, commerce, agriculture, industrialization, and of course, cultural identity and more than human worldings. Artist duo Laurent Gutierrez and Valerie Potfe, who have spent enormous time in Hong Kong and Peru with Delta, term this distinct liquid condition of the Delta as liquid geography, or island networks. To describe the historical marine culture dated from the Neolithic time of the region with South China Sea, as well as important roles it played in the flourishing of marine silk, uh, maritime silk road between 10th to 17th century to exchange goods and cultures with Arabic and European countries. Also, the Canton system from 17th to 19th century played a crucial role between uh, Guangzhou and European colonial powers for the Qin uh, dynasty to regulate through waterways. And then the opium wars waged by Britain that integrated China into the global capitalist order, or we could say the capitalism violently, which also resulted in Hong Kong becoming a British colony. The Delta is also home to historically water-dwelling amphibious communities such as Danga people. They have developed distinct water-faring cultures with fishing, pearl diving, and water-centric cosmologies. Their ocean nomadic trajectories mark the historical suppression from the Central Imperial Chinese states and the European and Japanese colonial powers in the 19th and 20th centuries. We could say there is a strong liquid visuality in the mapping and imagination of this region. However, the artist Stu Gautreis and Potefe also suggested there is a solidification tendency with anthropogenic economic development in large-scale infrastructure constructions, such as land reclamation and bridges construction since the 1980s. As we may see in this print made by the artist, in which the built landscape shows a dominantly outstretching tendency against enveloping water bodies. Inspired by this finding and embodied with my own experience, I elaborate on this solidification as emphasized on built technological, developmental, and land-centric connections and aesthetics over historical water connections and aesthetics. I want to trace this solidification to an earlier period, the Chinese socialist construction in the 1960s. An important case and visual registers is the Dongjiang Shenzhen water supply project built in the 1960s, and a documentary documented its, uh, document its construction. The background of the documentary is set in one of the most severe droughts in British-controlled Hong Kong in 1963. The water crisis is unprecedented with the drought and the huge amount of Chinese immigrants seeking refuge in Hong Kong from social and political unrest during the 1940s, 1950s from mainland China. 
The colonial government issued a strict water rationing policy to limit water supply to only four hours every four days. Eventually, a water supply system was negotiated by the British and the Chinese officials and completely built by China. This water supply project provides um, a human-built system that's 83 kilometer channel and eight pumping stations to deliver water from the East River, which is uh, one of the tributary of the Peru Delta, through eight pumping stations all the way to Shenzhen and then to Hong Kong. What's challenging of this uh, of this project is since historically the East River actually flows from the higher uh, south to the lower north, they have to reverse the river flow to uplift the river to 46 kilometers above sea level through every station until it reach Hong Kong. So until today, actually, this water supply system still provides more than 70% of the yearly fresh water supply in Hong Kong. So the, the documentary film was made by a Hong Kong leftist filmmaker, Luo Guanhong, and film company Great Wall. It reached great theatrical success in 1965 with full houses at every screening for 10 days in Hong Kong. Interesting, the first half of the film was made as black and white to show the construction procedure and changed to color towards the completion of the project. Along with the color change, there are also what I term Maui's dialectic comparisons of the scenic water rich socialist mainland and segregated and water scarce uh, drought strike in Hong Kong. There's also workers from all walks of life mobilized their restless strength against extreme weather conditions. There's a voiceover recounted that the construction workers had defeated five typhoons of level 10 and beyond and resisted the worst 50 year rainstorms and floodings. As seen in these two screenshots, it documents the typical slogans painted on the construction site made the river reverse or race against time to struggle with bad weather. So the divergent and reversal of the East River serves as one ultimate qualitative change after collective socialist labor's quantitative strength to struggle against nature. Uh, here I want to show two clips of this documentary. First one is the construction um, part. <laughs> scene as we can see, I argue that the film demonstrates what Tina Mei Chen termed as human machine continuum, with laborers closely shown with their tools and rhythmic working bodies against the natural landscape, and a popular socialist song titled We Workers Have Strength. This collective subjectivity of socialist workers' bodies, mechanical tools, and the natural landscape being remodeled, shown through the film with smooth editing and technological sublime beauty, represent the process of what I call denaturalization and renaturalization of the East River and the Peru River Delta. In another ending sequence here, I would also like to show you.
ending sequence that it vividly visualized again how the Anguli River is transformed to people's water through socialist science and mass labor. It connects the East River, the water station, to the ocean in Hong Kong, and eventually the drinking water taps in the Hong Kong streets with smooth cinema montage. It, a kind of qualitative transformation of nature from the accumulated quantitative transformation is again allured and naturalized. One intriguing component of the film is also the coverage of a famous circus troupe performing for the construction workers. The Chi National Circus of China is a very famous circus from the very northeastern part of China. It's more than 3,000 kilometers away from the Pearl River Delta. But apparently this kind of appreciation performance is uh, with, as we can see with bears and with dogs and also acrobatic actors. It's very common in that period. And to film the entire performance event is also very common as a theatrical entertainment for Hong Kong cinema at that time. So um, comprehensively, I argue, this animal performance spectacle blends with the water construction spectacle to represent how the Chinese Republic and the collective socialist laborers control and discipline natural actors to serve livelihoods and human entertainment needs. The completion of the water project also enabled the Delta village, village communes to dig up diversion canals to use the river water for further irrigation and drinking. Village farmers are mobilized to dig out farmland in barren mountains areas with a new river flow, which reflects a massive movement of land reclamation projects for agriculture at that time. Overall, I argue that an Anthropocene visuality could be clearly traced in this documentary through the mobilization and aestheticization of the working human bodies, the reverse water bodies, and the manipulated animal bodies into a controlled and anthropocentric entity. The visualization process denaturalized and renaturalized the water body with a solidifying tendency. Another case I want to discuss briefly is a more contemporary production, which inherits this man conquering nature aesthetics and emphasizes on solidification of the water bodies with more cutting edge visual techniques. It's basically a promotion video made for the 40 year anniversary of the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone in 2020. cost a million uh, Chinese yuan to complete. And this video actually captures the natural material foundation of the Shenzhen development myth and its Anthropocene zeitgeist. We see in this clip a vivid visualization of land reclamation for urbanization using computer simulations and special effects. How Shenzhen from a fishing village has grown to be a global metropolis over the past 40 years. Since the establishment of the Special Economic Zone in 1980, Shenzhen has reclaimed at least 6,900 hectares of land, and there are plans to reclaim another 5,000 hectares by 2025. <coughs> Dennis Bernard drew a vivid de description of the Delta Reclamation, that while the general archaeological layers of past epochs visualizes a vertical timeline of sediments, the Delta built on extensive reclamations provide us a horizontal or a literal timeline, a marriage of linear progress of modernity. However, this linear human mastery visuality is increasingly destroyed and exposed of its fragile nature by flooding and rising sea levels. 
I mean, and climate change. If we take the counter visuality of reversing the Anthropocene visuality aesthetics literally to reverse this video as we have seen here, I leave you to imagine. We can find a playful but revealing result what Vernon termed reclaiming the space of reclamations. A more radical counter-visuality of the Pereira Delta in its historical legal connection that I trace is a federal visualization of a more than human being named Bo Ting in Hong Kong visual culture. In the context of Hong Kong's handover from Britain to China in 1997, the Hong Kong curator and art historian scholar Oscar Hall curated three consecutive exhibitions from 1997 to 1999 around this mysterious half-fish, half-human figure, Lotte. So, scattered historical recordings about Lotte actually can be found dating back from the Tang Dynasty. And uh, in all these representations, Lotte is often depicted as a rebellious army leader from the Eastern Jing Dynasty around 300 AD, who as a tribe leader fled after defeat and marginalized into remote islands of Lantau down the Pearl River estuary and the surrounding ocean and so slowly become a fish with his tribement. The curator evoked the figure loading to make metaphorical references of Hong Kong people's in-betweenness with handover from Britain to Hong Kong. Loting is also presented in the exhibition as ancestors of Danga people to associate um, the historical suppression of the water development communities endure from the land communities and cultures. The curator invited many artists to recreate Lotin's history with pseudo historical texts and archaeological artifacts, eroding the boundaries of mythology, historiography, irony, and authenticity. It was done so convincingly that the curator recalled hearing a visitor who is a father with his children, telling his children that Loting is actually their ancestor, as almost he would have done in a normal education museum. So although the exhibition did not really catch much greater public attention at the time when it was held, the motif of Loting was growing more and more popular in the recent years. The obvious element at play is the complex geopolitics and identity recognitions of Hong Kong people since 1997 handover from Britain to China, where a sentiment of marginalization and exile always prevail. Loting is often called for as a rebellion symbol to contest controlling power. But I argue that we could also comprehend this figure from an critical lens. That, uh, that this affinity to non-human feral beings also reflects an ecological crisis sensed by the Hong Kong people living in an intensive neoliberal and technological urban metropolis, whose future blueprint now is largely shaped by another developmental technological system, such as the Greater Bay Area being one of the most important developmental projects in China which will integrate Hong Kong, Macau, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and other peripheral Delta cities into one vast mega-region. The project is envisioned to further solidify control over federal waters and cultures. One of its infrastructures already completed is this world's longest sea bridge of Hong Kong, Zhuhai Macau Bridge. They're trying to bring this region solidification to another step, which has been criticized by its potential profound ecological, crisis, uh, ecological consequences. Over the past few years, there are increasingly lively recreations of low things. Some are actively embedded with eco-critical critiques, such as the painting of the Pink Sea by Aunt Nevelle who in incorporating low tank were the pink dwarfings that actually home to this Pearl Delta region. Or the fiction film made by the, the uh, famous director Stephen Trell that actively criticized land reclamations. I argue that this continued recreations of low things in various art forms reflect a feral imagination to decenter the human, to engage with the biopolitics and geopolitics of the more than humans in the Peruvian Delta. It helps us to visualize and reimagine a multi species co living community in the fluid ground closer to the feral water bodies. 
To conclude of this packed presentation, I have examined the framework of Anthropocene visuality and counter visuality in heterogeneous Chinese visual culture, and challenging the current Western centric perspective and generalization of Chinese texts. I present a particular ongoing case study on the Peruvian Delta, identify the solidification tendency of the natural water bodies and the denaturalization and renaturalization aesthetics as one Chinese Anthropocene visuality from the 1960s to today. I attempted to configure possible counter visualities from creative feral visualizations of a non human figure, Lo Ting, in Hong Kong creative arts, which shed light on the fluid identity, non anthropocentric multi species imaginations of the amphibious world beyond borders and political constraints. As this research is still in its early stage, I envision more patchwork to thread different historical and spatial visual cases around the Delta. I also very much appreciate your suggestions and comments. Thank you.